Okay, welcome everybody. Um, still some people trickling in, but we'll get started. Um, I'm Steve Madden. I've uh, been with Equinix for five years now. Uh, this is my fifth Catalyst event. Um, it's getting better every year, I gotta say. Um, and a lot of the uh, messages that you hear here, especially the keynote this morning, identify very closely with what we do and where we work and, and how, we, how we see the world. Um, first thing though, uh, as you came in, you should have got a ticket. Um, that's actually for a, a raffle at the end of the, of the session. We're gonna raffle off uh, a, a set of uh, Apple iPods, AirPods, Apple AirPods. So hang around, see if you win that, good luck with that. Um, it's always fun. Each of our sessions throughout this week has something to give away. So I wanted to open with a little bit of a, a level set on what we're seeing, where we're seeing it, and how we kind of view the world. Um, it's not very different than kind of what you're hearing at the event, but I think it's interesting that you're seeing it from a different perspective with Equinix. The future of IT infrastructure is everywhere. You heard that at the keynote. This slide is actually um, a little bit older than the keynote, so we were saying it earlier, but we agree that things are just moving more and more distributed out uh, to the outside world as we go. Um, and the role of the corporate data center is shrinking, meaning the traditional um, single company owned data center. But what that line doesn't say, which really it should say, is the role of infrastructure in digital and the importance of infrastructure in digital and your role is going up, is becoming more critical. I think people are missing that technology is no longer a division in the company or a segment in a vertical industry. It's, in, it's increasingly become integral to business going forward. So you are gonna become the most critical function in your company because you'll become a digital company first and then whatever other industry market you're in, second. And not, not everyone's seen that yet, but the companies that have are investing very heavily in their infrastructure. Infrastructure is not going away. It's a hybrid multi-cloud world, blending cloud and edge. Well, I don't need to bash that one to death. We've been hearing about that. Um, but our core workloads are moving closer to the edge, and I'm gonna explain where we see that and what, which ones, et cetera, and talk a bit about that. The future of infrastructure is an ecosystem of partners. Um, this wasn't touched on much, but understand that in digital, you're not gonna be going after a market or producing something or doing it entirely yourselves. You will use other companies and other things and bolt them together to build composite products and solutions that have greater advantages combined than any single company can compete with. That ecosystem effect is what's driving digital in the future. Cloud is not the end game, it's part of the conversation. I think that's because we wanna make sure that you take into account that you're building these tools to solve those larger business problems. It's not a replacement for the corporate data center. Just shifting everything from your corporate data center to the cloud hasn't changed your architecture, hasn't changed your business posture yet, but it may enable you to move certain services f faster. These ecosystems are locally and privately interconnecting achieving differentiated advantage and efficiency. I'm gonna talk about that a fair bit. Because ultimately, if your business process is a connection of six different companies, and you're transacting using traffic, how you're interconnecting, where you're interconnecting, and who you're interconnecting with, is gonna be as much a business differentiator for you in the market than anything else. So I'm gonna break this up into four sections. I'm gonna quickly talk a bit about us, just to make sure that we level set in the room who Equinix is and what we do. Um, but also why uh, we can come to the table with a perspective that's a bit unique. Um, and for people that already know that, there'll be an update, because I can show you what we've done lately. But then I really want to talk about insights and strategy we see in the data we use that's not really available to you or hasn't been available to you yet that we can share with you. And I brought with me data that we've used in our latest um, index, which I'll talk about as well, which shows what all the industries and other companies are doing right now in terms of what I'm talking about and how fast they're doing it. So when Eli says, you know, are you moving fast enough? Is your CIO doing what they need to do? My view is, let's show you what people are doing and how fast they're doing it, and you can decide yourself if you're moving quick enough or not. And then I want to talk about edge advantage with a few more points around what we see and why and some concrete examples um, and qualification as to why that's an advantage. What does that mean? So let's get into it. Okay, so Equinix has been in the center of the digital transformation for about 20 years. It started with um, the whole internet thing that Eli was also talking about, which I found amusing. 
is that the internet actually couldn't scale until they found a place where all of the major network companies could come together and exchange traffic in a neutral location. It had to be neutral. That's kind of a key word. So Equinix was born. And from there, we started creating sites where the network companies exchange traffic to grow and scale the internet. After that, though, edge-based services like web, content, digital media, gaming, et cetera, started to realize that being closer to the edge was important for differentiated advantage. So we started to see all these functions move closer to the edge. On the flip side of that, business evolved into digital electronic trading. So the first, some of the first digital, digital businesses were electronic trading systems. And they showed us that you need to aggregate the meeting place of those locations to do business uh, with low, low latency and transparency. But after that, cloud came to the market. They wanted to be close to the networks and close to content and actually get closer to the enterprises. So you can see network has been core in these first four steps. But in the last two to three years, it's shifted dramatically now, where we see enterprises from all different industries directly interconnecting and peering with everybody and sharing traffic in digital ecosystems, which don't have a core network provider in the middle. The network is now a participant in the exchange, right? Not, not the core medium. And that's an important shift. So we've been watching this happen, and really the three major patterns that we see, digital transformation meaning uh, from an infrastructure or an architectural change, is one, building out that new corporate infrastructure. And I'm just called that digital infrastructure at the bottom. But they're building out a regional hybrid core. What that means is they might have a presence in an east instance of a cloud, a west instance of a cloud, and do that in a couple other countries, so six different presences, maybe seven if they do central as well. But they've now distributed their core across multiple regional hubs. That allows them to rewire their own infrastructure networks, connect into partners better, connect the clouds better, redistribute workloads. But beyond that, on top of that rewired infrastructure is a whole business edge strategy. That's where we talk about things like, how do I do real-time facial recognition at airports? How do I handle MRI scans, which used to be 20 images, now they're 20,000 per scan? How do I do IoT? How do I just get better user experience? How do I win the gaming industry you know, like, and, and game that? Right? All of those things that are real-time edge facing or a large amount of data processing are starting to see new use cases out there. And in that, also in that edge sort of bucket was where we see SD-WAN, 5G, and all the access last mile network aggregation. But on the other side is the business exchange, which is where all business, once you digitize each of your business, uh, business processes, and then you think about all the companies you work with in a traditional ecosystem do the same, then ultimately it all becomes a digital ecosystem, right? Because that's how you start exchanging. An API-driven business environment. So we heard Eli talk about an API-driven infrastructure, yes. Being able to roll and deploy things out to the edge, absolutely. And business will be an API-driven function soon. And you need to prepare for all three. We meet with customers who are in different places doing different parts of this. Inve investment banks and, and uh, low latency trading companies were in the exchange bucket first, and we helped them figure out their infrastructure later. Um, others came to us with security at edge problems and figured out infrastructure later. It's not a one, two, three step, but all three are part of that digital transformation strategy. And that begins with having the best architecture. Eventually, people realized that what they'd been organically growing over the last 10 to 15 years actually wasn't designed for what they're trying to do today. It was great, put a lot of work into it. I'm a practitioner myself. I spent uh, 17 years on Wall Street, JB Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, building some of the most advanced infrastructures in the world. But we also realized when I was running a CTO office that we had it all upside down we needed to build edge hubs and a distributed core. That's what sort of the right-hand side looks like. All of the architectures we see these companies build all look like that. They're all very symmetrical. They've placed hubs in strategic locations. They keep all the traffic local, so they're not paying for WAN charges, and they directly peer with everybody. We decided it needed a name <laughs> since everyone was doing it. And so we played off what we were trying to do with the services-oriented architecture, which is dynamically connecting application functions together. We said, well, these are dynamically connecting business functions together. Let's call it an interconnection-oriented architecture. We published that in 2015, and we have built this knowledge base, which the link to it's up on the screen. It's free. 
um, has about 70 odd blueprints and design patterns on what these companies have done and how they did it. If you have the best architecture, you know how you architect for digital matters, but you're also going to need, which is where we come in, the right platform to architect that on top of. Now, I'm not going to bleed this dry, but we're currently around 200 data centers, 52 major metro cities. Uh, we cover 90 plus percent of all the major global traffic exchange points. 10,000 customers connecting to each other 340,000 times. Right? It's huge. Um, this infrastructure that you see here, all these red dots, have a software-defined interconnection platform, which we call ECX Fabric, in them. They're also all connected to each other. So any of our customers who connects into any one of these red dots is able to connect to any cloud, any other business partner, or any other of their own locations themselves, to themselves, anywhere in the world, with direct private interconnection, all through an API, all on demand. We've extended that also to now enable you to place edge services in those locations, also virtual, and you can spin them up and create points of presence in foreign countries to reduce the barrier of entry, or even just because you're getting started, it's going to take a while for the hardware to get deployed, let's just run with the virtual instance first. This is what people are using the platform for, and I watched through on the bottom there that we're also leading in our sustainability initiative to reduce carbon footprint. A lot of our customers who are like-minded who are trying to reduce their own carbon footprint like Equinix because we're helping them do it. As they move more things into Equinix and close their own data centers, they're also reducing their sustainability initiatives and carbon footprint. But you have to have the right platform, and you need to know how and where you interconnect matters. But also, who can you connect to is kind of where it, where it lands, right? It's all very well to be in the most advanced data center in the world, but if there's nobody there to talk to, it really doesn't matter. So we spend a lot more time being the trustworthy partner to build these, these dense and diverse ecosystems of, of people to come to the platform and offer and provide you know, services to, to consumers, and vice versa, our consumers are actually becoming providers. Let me unpack that a little bit. They start off consuming cloud and infrastructure services, but now they're actually publishing their own business SaaS services back onto the exchange and being available to be connected to by other customers. So the line between consumer and producer is uh, starting to gray. The other thing I like about this slide is enterprises as, as you know, 16 verticals, and financial services in itself is a vertical. If you connect those together, it's actually the largest segment we have. Enterprises are the biggest customer base of Equinix. So that brings us back to you know, why you see our tagline being reach everywhere, interconnect everyone, integrate everything. We're a global interconnection platform for digital business. So what are people doing with this infrastructure? We have been tracking this and designing uh, a data warehouse and machine learning algorithm, which is in its fifth generation. So it's not that we just, just did it. We've been doing this for years and evolving it over time. And it's getting larger and smarter as we go. And a lot of what we've done is put in not just data we have on what we're seeing and observing, but we also bought a lot of industry data. You know, services like FactSet, Intricately, Dun & Bradstreet, et cetera, you can buy pre-cleaned, pre pre-screened public information that's been packaged up and use it for data analytics. We watch what people are doing in terms of where they're deployed. We look at their spending patterns. We look at what technologies they're using. We study all these things. We also look at the companies that are doing excessively well and with our machine learning algorithms try to learn what is it about these companies that's a characteristic that's common and how many of our people who aren't customers yet have the same characteristic and how can we help? How do we point out what these things are? The best thing for me is we learn what they all con collectively do and consistently do, and we publish all of that knowledge in terms of use cases, the index itself, which I'll talk about. We published industry playbooks and the blueprints and design patterns are all outputs of this knowledge system. So let's talk about the index real quick. We published this first index in 2017, and it was because I just talked about interconnection and how big it is, but no one was tracking it. We had Huawei tracking you know, between region, bandwidth, consumption, and growth. We had uh, Cisco VNI tracking mobile and, and how many cat videos are being downloaded and everything. But no one was tracking how much are people directly exchanging traffic with each other. So we created the index for that reason. And we measured it in interconnection bandwidth across industries. And the next volume of that is coming out next month. And I was with the customer advisory board earlier this year. And they're saying, can you make sure in this next volume you can show us what other companies are doing? Um, 
and who they're connecting to, et cetera, because we kind of want to take that information back to our own CIOs. And I said, sure. Um, I showed them some data at that, at that advisory board, and I brought the same data with me today. It's the benchmark section. Rather than scoop my volume three, I brought back volume two's data, which all I really want you to get from this slide is that interconnection bandwidth is, is growing twice as fast as peak traffic on the internet, and it will be about 10, and it will be about 10 times the volume. Um, it's a 48% compound annual growth in traffic and exchange, which you know, as, as of uh, 2021 was gonna be 8,200 terabits a second, or 33 zettabytes a year. Um, it's just one of those numbers that's really hard to sort of understand what that means. All internet traffic is gonna be three, to give you a perspective. So it's growing very fast, and it's a huge, huge amount of traffic. And when we talk about the amount of data and analytics and all these things people are talking about, the internet is not the medium by which all that data is being transversed and moved around. It's not. Um, neither is MPLS. It's mostly interconnection bandwidth from there. Um, and that's why you localize it and not move it, just to move that much data is expensive. But this on the side that shows what could be done in one minute concurrently, like not not all, this or this or this, but all of these at the exact same time. And you start to see the size and magnitude of what digital business is going to look like, and we're only really just getting started. Um, I'll throw in there that we've already assessed that uh, 5G will actually be maxed out in terms of what its capability is by 2025. It's going to be not enough. We have to do it because the edge access needs the bandwidth now, but there's going to have to be a continuous improvement in bandwidth um, every three to five years regardless to keep up with this pace of traffic. Why is that? Well, the index basically points out that there's five major macro trends which affect every company in every region, regardless of your industry. And these all, of, all lead back to needing a way to exchange traffic and or put in different uh, controls at interconnection points. Digital business, the digitization of business we talked about, right? It's gonna need to be real-time real -time interactions with people, uh, clouds, locations, data, sensors, you know, metering water <laughs> in Uganda, all of those things are happening. That kind of leads into urbanization, which is it's not happening in the same locations you are today. It's happening all over the world. So how do you get your own infrastructure to where it needs to be, where the business transactions are happening? Third, security. This year has been uh, an eye-opening and awakening uh, year for security. We've been talking about cybersecurity all along, and it's one of the major tracks of this conference for the reason that it's becoming rather impactful, we could say. Digital business means that security breaches matter more than they did before, because the impact on the company is so much higher than it was before. Now, I've got a stat here showing that people are buying um, cybersecurity insurance, and it's gonna be a $20 billion industry by 2025. But that's kind of sad, actually, why not have CIOs invest half of the amount of money that it's going to cost in a fee from a violation, which is about 160 to $200 million? Invest half of that in your security infrastructure. I'm sure the security people would like that as a budget. But why not just split it 50-50 and say, let's just invest in the security infrastructure and be done? And we'll talk a bit about that too. But then data volumes and compliance right, are kind of hand in hand, because what are you securing? And mostly it's theft of data and, uh, and regulations. But but that is becoming a huge problem. Data is still growing exponentially too. It's not growing quite as fast as interconnection, but it, is, it, is, it does have an equivalently high compound annual growth rate. So whatever you're trying to solve for data today, just assume that in two to three years, it's gonna be double that. Are you architecting for the future, right? Not just solving for today. And then lastly, if you have digitized your business, you're in all the right business locations, you've figured out security, and you can exchange data quite well, you can now participate in digital business ecosystems. That's the barrier to entry. Because if you show up at a digital business ecosystem, uh, my analogy is I showed up at an auction once um, here, here or it was in California, and I've never been to an auction before. No, actually auctioning pigs. <laughs> I went in and, and stood there, and I had no idea what was going on. There's this guy rambling so fast I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I couldn't even figure out which pig we were talking about. I didn't have a banner, I couldn't participate, and it was all over in minutes. That's exactly what digital business is gonna be like if you don't have the right credentials, you don't have the right placement, you can't move quickly, you don't have your API set up, 
it's not going to be a participation, uh, easy participant event. It's going to be something you're going to be geared for. And that requires, I've got my security down, I've got my data down, I, I've got my, my local interconnection. I'm connected to all the right people. I'm ready to go. I'm now a player. So what are the steps that all of these companies take in transforming to leap ahead? I say leap ahead because each of them do. And these are the words our customers used. They enabled us to leap ahead from where we were to where we are today. I'm not going to go through all these. We'll send out these slides, and also it'll be in the index. But network optimization and hybrid multi-cloud are the first two that tends to happen first. And, and you heard in the presentation this morning, it's not just about the network, but they started with the network. Because foundationally, it is actually starting with the network. How you're connected and where and to who matters, right? What you run on top of that comes next. Our customers, when they re-optimize into the configuration I showed you, typically rip out about 60% of their carrier costs. Now, if you're talking about a fairly large enterprise, say 100,000 people, um, multinational at least, um, that's about $100 million in WAN spend that they have each year. This could be a $60 million save. That alone, we go in and say, can we help you rip out $60 million? Because if we can, you can reinvest that money into the rest of your transformation going forward and not have to go back for capital investment. CIOs love that one, by the way. And they typically want to do that first because it frees up capital, right? I know there's a lot of people saying, I'm moving my apps to the cloud, and I've got to give you know, developers access to the cloud. That's all important, too. But how you fund and pay for this and how each of these stages pays back each time to show progress is also important. Hybrid multi-cloud is not just to the clouds, as I mentioned before. There's a lot of partners that you already connect to, and how you connect to them isn't necessarily as efficient as it could be. So that's part of that, too. People then start placing security controls at those intersection points where traffic is being exchanged. So if somebody from the outside on the internet is hacking into your environment, they have to traverse one of those connection points. Likewise, the way they architect this environment is it has to come back out. So it's got to traverse twice. So they're checking it on the way in, and they're also checking it on the way back out. And I'll explain what they're doing there, too. Distributed data then gets placed either in those co-location points around the world or is accessed through this fabric as well. So you're not moving it around. You're localizing where it needs to be regionally for sovereignty reasons, which was also mentioned today. But you have control over where you put it and who can have access to it. The application exchange, or the fifth step, is then how do I then position my storefront for digital business strategically so I can compete in digital markets? There's a report in our booth that uh, a third-party analyst firm, I won't name them because I'm at Gartner, um, produced for us with some of our top customers. And they actually interviewed the customers, pulled out the data, went through the numbers, and built this report. This is our second one of these reports. And it outlines in excruciating detail where they saved this money, how they saved this money, and what the benefits were. So we commissioned it, but it's not ours. It was written by our customers with another analyst firm. What does it look like when it's done? Digital ready infrastructure. To us, that means you can start operating in any country or any location you want. You can connect to anybody you want. You can bring in any clouds or cloud services you want. You've uh, offset your internet access and ingress, egress for internet wherever you need to. You've, you've routed traffic to the nearest point where a SaaS application is rather than deal with the unpredictability of the internet. You've reduced your security posture or, th or, or exposure such that now most of the traffic's dedicated and private. Very little actually continues to run over the internet. If anything, it's the last mile, right, two endpoints. So let's talk about what that means for competitive advantage at the edge. What this shift is doing as people shift away from a couple of centralized data centers backhauling everything back to these regional, I'm calling them hybrid core, um, regional hybrid cores, these hubs that are maybe in you know, US East, US West, you know, the typical cloud regions as well. And not just one cloud, multi-cloud. That's distributed out further. So now the reach from, from that point took you from very far away, which could be up around the 100 millisecond range, now approximately getting closer to around 60 milliseconds to most targets. Some targets could still be further. But even further, if you get towards the metro edge, if it's not the same metro city as where your cloud hub is, it's getting down to around 20 milliseconds. So when we say people are moving further out, 
beyond the hybrid core points, they're starting to put smaller hubs closer in proximity to the cities where th that aren't part of that hybrid core. So if it's si Silicon Valley and DC, they might put one in Seattle, they might put one in LA, right? They're putting it a little bit further out, which gets them closer. I'll talk about that a bit more. But really what this is sort of saying is that here, if the majority of people are being trained to expect this kind of performance, without doing anything, you're suddenly too slow, right? It's not that you're having a bad day or that your network's running slower than yesterday. It's just the market's moved. It's moved without you and left you behind. The people who are moving out to the edge are trying to do real time. You know, you want it now? I got my, uh, my rabid rabbit up there to sort of depict that. But essentially what we're saying is over time, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse things, as things keep shifting if you can't keep on top of controlling your latency, controlling your, your own user experience, and controlling data. And that's why when I say people use this architecture to leapfrog to the end, is because they flip it. They start with endpoints wherever they need them and then control traffic from there. They're not trying to catch up. They're not trying to add things to the network to make it go faster, because that's inevitable. Data keeps going up. Latency needs to go down. It's just a matter of time before that that's ends up um, being wasted. So the only thing I say is staying still doesn't work. Effectively, staying still doesn't work. You have to move. You have to. And the worst part is there's probably not even a train that's going to get him. I'm thinking of a canister falling on him or something, because it's digital. You don't know what's going to happen or where it's going to come from. It doesn't follow the path of traditional business. So where are our companies today? Let's do the industry benchmark. This data set um, we pulled, since we came out with a lot of this story in 2015, we started tracking companies that joined with us in Q1 of 2016 and snapped a line at Q1 of 2019 and said, what were they able to achieve in three years, right? It's good enough time. 450 companies, a three-year journey, half of them, uh, 55%, are Fortune 500 and Global 2000, which means 45% of them are not, right? 45% of them, not all of them are even global. Some of them are local only and they're smaller companies. So we had a good mix there. It covers 4,100 implementations worldwide, spread evenly across the three regions. 35% Americas, 35% EMEA, 30% in Asia. So it's a pretty decent microcosm of 14 industries and what they did in three years. For the data geeks, what they've done by industry is gonna be shown in the index so if we look at pick one, content digital media, obviously going to be edge-centric, so they've deployed more locations on average than everybody else. Cabinets to us represent the amount of stuff people are putting into those edge hubs. So it's not just a cage with a switch in it. There's hundreds of cabinets being put out there with data, infrastructure, security infrastructure, some analytics, um, and not to mention connectivity, of course. And then how many times or what are they connecting to? So here are the number of connections, and this is, by the way, the industry average for that industry, and then the overall average across all. So these are all averages. So clearly people in this industry are much higher. But you know, half of them are trying to solve network for digital. They're trying to scale their infrastructure for digital. Connecting to multiple um, networks too, I'll talk about that. They're connecting to clouds, but also connecting to each other. And business partners, because business still needs to exchange traffic securely and privately as well. And partners, if that exchange is happening over the internet, partners tend to be a weakest link in some cases to your own um, you know, impact for, for a penetration. So let's, let's use a less data geeky way of showing it. So they've deployed, I picked these locations, they've deployed some locations around the world. They're solving for digital infrastructure, they're building a hybrid multi-core. On average it's nine locations, 200 cabinets, 330 interconnections, but on average, it's 18 different networks they're using to do that, because they're leveraging the ecosystem to cut down the network costs by bidding them against each other or buying it through um, overlays. They're using, on average, two of the major infrastructure as a service providers. Um, that's not all cloud, so it doesn't count third-party hosting or SaaS, that's hundreds. But for the top five to six of them, at least two. And if you think about it, that's in each region two, so that's two US East, two US West, two, so there's 10 or 12 actual connections, but 
but a number of providers, two IaaS providers typically, and 14 partners. This is the part that's the exchange. How are you doing your digital supply chain, value chain, and business processing interconnecting and keeping traffic off the internet? That's global, but let's, let's also pull up North America. This is what North America looks like specifically. So you see it's around, you know, around four, some three, some five, but some, around four locations each, decent number of cabinets, decent number of connections. The percentages didn't really change that much. So it's very, very typical, very similar. What does that look like, a picture? Here, I overlaid the green and the yellow back to that um, advantage, uh, edge advantage I was talking about before. The green is in proximity to the metro. The yellow is still within about 60 milliseconds uh, in an optimized network. So what they're doing here, again, 10 networks, two as 10 partners, even in the US alone, is they start by connecting their data centers into these major hubs and then wire those together. Now they configure SD-WAN and start moving ISP for internet offload, saving a bunch of money on the network infrastructure. They interconnect more clouds and cloud partners where they need to be. If the ecosystem of who they need to connect to is, say, in Dallas, then they might put a hub in Dallas to be in proximity to that ecosystem of partners. Once they've done that, they place security in these hubs, so all of those exchanges between on-ramp and off-ramp, in and out of cloud, between partners, et cetera, all goes through a, a somewhat localized security stack, right? So they're in control of the traffic coming in, the traffic going back out. They're integrating data. A lot of those cabinets aren't all of the data, but we expect about 30% of most enterprise workloads will end up being co-located in the edge for just reasons of choice or reasons of need. That, in a lot of cases, is showing up inside these hubs where they're placing either um, storage services, data services, streaming services, uh, having it accessed by multiple clouds. So there is no ingress egress cost, they're just reading it from there. And or they can't move it because it's too big, or for regulatory reasons it has to stay there. Or it could just be sensitivity. Today people's appetite for putting really customer centric data in places that they don't think they're fully in control of yet, and I'm saying it's not secure, they're not in control of yet, they don't want to do that. In which case what we see here though is it's still growing. Because like I said, data's growing. It's getting a bigger problem all the time. And latency and the speed of light is not changing. So lastly, what this also does is if you have a, a, you know, an employee trying to access, I don't know, like Workday or something, a SaaS app, you can take their traffic, route them through your nearest hub, you route them over your network, and then pop them back out over the ISP to the SaaS application. So these companies are also improving all of their SaaS, ac SaaS access performance as well far greater than it would be over the internet, and a lot safer. Because the chances of any kind of a man in the middle in the last mile on two ends is much smaller than running across the internet and networks. This, uh, this, this use case kind of I'm giving you here is actually part of our demo session tomorrow at 10.45. It's a practitioner's view, not, a, not an architecture data view. They're gonna walk through how to do it step by step and show you some of those techniques that they're using. So okay, so let's talk about edge advantage. What does that mean? Well, it comes back to why the best architecture matters. So this is what you might look like today. And trust me, when I first meet customers, they'll say, yep, that's what we look like today. Here we've got a few issues. We've got resiliency and stability problems. We've got user experience issues potentially somewhere, and you don't know why, because you're not necessarily in the direct path. You have penetration attacks attacking potentially cloud and getting data or other penetration attacks happening in the environment. You've got performance and troubleshooting where a process is running slow and you can't figure out why, and it turns out it's a service somewhere that may not even be in your control. And there's capacity challenges in that if things change and traffic shifts, how do you rewire for that, right, effectively? Over here, resiliency is part of the fabric. If you lose a link, you can use internet still for the last mile, or you can use the fabric to reroute. You can monitor and control user experience if it's routing through any of these endpoints. And the more edge points you have, the more control of end, over end user experience you have. You can do real-time defense by placing security, in, sorry, defense in depth with compliance. You can place the data in, in conjunction with the security to monitor access to data coming in and also access the data going back out. A lot of policy enforcement is done here as to, wait a minute, no one should ever have to be able to retrieve that data and send it outside the network, so we're not going to let that go out. Endpoint to endpoint process transparency. Hard one, right? Well, 
a mobile user in that location is coming through, coming down to this region, accessing this app. We can watch all of that because you have full transparency at all ends of the, not just at both ends, but also through the middle. So you can see everything and capacity control where it's needed. In fact, a lot of people are doing predictive capacity planning because they have this much information. They can see in advance what's going on. So the competitive advantage comes from four key things that so far aren't changing. One, I mentioned the data explosion. Data is going to continue to exponentially grow. There's another index um, that's published by IDC that talks about data. I pulled that out. It said 30% of real time, 30% of data is going to be real time by 2025, and it's going to be 50 zettabytes. So okay, <laughs> moving that would be tremendously expensive, but but it's going to be hard to handle, which is also as discussed today. Distance um, is the one that's the most shockingly obvious, but the one we don't do anything about. Distance kills performance and business throughput. So if you think about business throughput traditionally, it's how much produce or products and stuff can you move in the market effectively, right? Well, in digital, it's traffic and processing and data exchange. How much can you do matters. How many credit card transactions you can do in a minute matters, right? For distance, if you move a process or add 30 milliseconds of latency to a process, your overall application throughput has been reduced by 8x. That's just physics. That's nothing you did wrong. If you add a 2% packet loss, which means you're not using a very clean, dedicated private network, it's 25 times less. And that's actually probably what you're operating on now. That's actually normal. <laughs> it's what people are used to. Now think about if you move those functions closer and took distance out, not just you're going to get better latency, that's, that's a good number, but your throughput, your application throughput goes through the roof. Transportation costs, moving data around, bandwidth, it's expensive. A lot of people are not moving it, they're just providing people access to it, which works if they're all in the same vicinity as where you are. But ingress and egress costs are not only expensive, I try not to harp on those because they could change, but every IS cloud provider has them, and they're all around the same amount, it's not just Amazon. That works out to be 100 terabytes being moved, cost $100,000 a year just to move it in and out of cloud. And that's just for you. If that data is being accessed as part of a business process by five of your providers, they're all paying for ingress and ingress costs or contributing to yours. And then lastly, alternatives that actually what was old is new again. Building an infrastructure that's designed to crunch data in a co-location or a private cloud does in cases work out to be much faster, much cheaper, and much better than trying to use one that's designed to do anything, right? a cloud infrastructure to do anything. That's not always the case, but in many cases it is. We've seen anything that's IOPS oriented, hyper-converged systems that are designed to maximize your IOPS and throughput will outperform a virtual machine every day of the week. It will outperform a thousand virtual machines because the cost of all those virtual machines added up will always be more than the hyper-converged infrastructure. So there's gonna be a game where for certain workload types, it doesn't make sense to scale them that way, it makes sense to scale them another way. Or put differently, optimizing for performance over flexibility will have its advantages and does have its advantages. What I'm showing here was an Hadoop cluster that was costing $500,000 a month. The customer paid two million bucks, put a bunch of Dell servers in Colo, and within four months had an ROI. Flat, zero, paid. That was just one example. That was their example, but that's one example. We're going to start building a lot of blueprints, patterns, and playbooks around application workloads, which ones are most affected by the edge, and how do you account for that? That's really what our, our content agenda is for the rest of this year. So what does that look like in a real architecture? I pulled up something that I'm not giving away any secrets, even though they're a massive customer of ours. They published it on the internet, so I don't feel bad. This is Google Stadia architecture, their gaming infrastructure. And I looked at it and laughed. People were like, why are you laughing? I said, that's IOA. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? So they have a bunch of back-end cloud cores, GCP, regional cores. They also have endpoints in Metro Hub locations. And they're accessing you know, as many users as they can with, with you know, client endpoints. The thing that's interesting about this infrastructure is it goes against some of our beliefs. The whole idea that you're going to push all of this technology out into people's houses and try to manage it and look after it, they're not doing that. 
the client endpoints are whatever endpoints you have. They're managing access to the client endpoints from this game platform services box. That manages whether you're on an iPad or an iPhone or a laptop or whatever. It handles that. And it does it all with UDP because it's the last mile. They're not worried about TCP anymore. Then once you're on this gaming platform, it spins up a virtual game client. Your console is spun up in the hub. It's then connected to a game server in the same data center. What do you think performance is going to be like on this gaming platform? Then to run it at scale, those game servers are synchronizing state back to the hybrid cloud core to do a global view of what's happening in the game. When I looked at this architecture, I thought, oh my god, that is an application view of, uh, I guess, a modern three-tier application architecture. Endpoint, edge, hybrid core, not you know, web application database, because it's not about the stack, it's about the distance, right? That's what matters. If anything else that scared me about this, no one paid any attention to Amazon when they sold books. This architecture doesn't have to be used for gaming. This architecture should be used for anything and everything. And it's typically similar to the data I showed you where people are building more hub locations, they're putting more cabinets in those locations, and they're syncing back to the hybrid cloud core. It's essentially what the benchmark data I showed you shows that every industry is doing. This is what the edge advantage means. And how much more people do that are going to start training the consumers and end users on what good looks like, and it's going to raise the bar. Back to the picture of uh, sitting where the train is. So that's what I have for you today. Um, I do want to make sure you understand that we have this, this full demo tomorrow. I'm really excited about it, so you should come. It's going to go through this where, he, where we're actually going to spin up locations, spin up hubs, show you the dynamic interconnection, show you the bandwidth differences, et cetera. Um, but also at our booth, we have a bunch of architects and very friendly people. We picked the friendliest people in our company to come to this event. Happy to talk to you. They're very smart. They answer any question you have. It doesn't even have to be about this. You can ask them about blockchain, ask them about anything. We see a lot of stuff. We also brought with us a lot of really good reports that you can just take, right? Really good ones that really kind of get into the details. And we have demos at the booth too. So if you don't, if you don't make this one tomorrow, then just come by to the booth and say, hey, can you show me how this dynamic stuff works or can you take me through it? And we'd be happy to do that. So all right, so I'm ending a few minutes early because I know people like to come up and ask questions. Please do, I'm right here. But thank you for attending today. Questionable health and less stress Having no possessions, no immeasurable wealth May you get a gold star on your next test May your educated guesses always be correct And may you win prizes shining like diamonds May you really own it each moment to the next or May the best of your todays be the worst of your tomorrow Forgot the most important part <laughs> Surprise nobody yelled out All right, who has 194 284. All right, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, everyone. <laughs>